hosted by Brian Tipton. And working behind the scenes are our Spanish interpreters, Jackie and Jasmine Metivier. So I'm going to start with a rundown of numbers, and I'll then turn it over to Director Sprayberry. So as seen on our website this morning, there are 1,307 cases now here in North Carolina of COVID-19. That's across 74 counties. The median age is 46. Again, this is the median age of people who tested positive for COVID-19. Currently, there are 137 hospitalizations. That's 137. And we've unfortunately had already six deaths. We've completed more than 20,000 tests um, across the state from labs, including the state, uh, the state lab and our private labs, that they are reporting both their negatives and their positives. There are still 8,000 tests that are pending, meaning they've been collected but not have been run yet. In terms of our hospital capacity numbers, which we are also now reporting on our website, we have more than 15,000 inpatient hospital beds in the state, of which 6,200 are empty. That's about 40% empty. And again, these numbers are based on about 64% of hospitals reporting at this point. Um, and does not include additional surge capacity. Um, we're working right now with our hospitals on that further plan around surge capacity, but as you can see, with 40% of our beds, we feel like we have the capacity we need right now. In terms of intensive care unit beds, there are 3,223 beds, of which 745 are empty, 23% empty. Again, this doesn't include surge beds and is based on about 60, <laughs> sorry about that, <laughs> is based on about 64% of hospitals reporting. Um, we've been working to expand our dashboard and we'll have a broader set of data that's available for you in the coming days, but do visit uh, dhhs.nc.gov, sorry, dhhsnc.gov slash coronavirus. Other things to remind folks today that the governor's executive order to stay home goes into effect at 5 p.m. today. I want to reemphasize, as we've been talking about throughout this beginning of this crisis, we do not have vaccines or treatment. Social distancing is the only tool we have to slow the spread of COVID-19 so fewer people get sick at the same time and so we don't overwhelm our hospitals. I can't stress it enough, your actions matter. Staying home matters. Staying home will save lives. And I know, this is really, really hard. Most of us have never lived through a time where we've had to take this kind of collective action to change our entire way of life in a matter of days. In many ways, this is like a war right here at home, and our enemy is this virus. It can hurt us, it can take our loved ones from us, and the only way we can win and save as many lives as possible is if we all do our part and stay home. We may be physically apart, but it's how we fare together as a community and as a state, and the more connected we know that we are through this virus by staying home to save lives. So if you're leaving your house, it really needs to be limited to going to the grocery store, to picking up medications, or maybe for a walk outside. If you do work for an essential business, like working in our healthcare industry or keeping our groceries and our pharmacies running, we still ask that you, protect, you practice as much social distancing as possible, and if not, then we want you to be limiting all of your activities and to please stay home. I did want to give a shout out today on Doctor's Day to my fellow physician colleagues out there, the ones on the front lines ready to treat patients with COVID-19. We're incredibly lucky to have some of the best doctors and nurses and other clinicians here in our state. Know that the governor and I, Director Sprayberry and his team are working night and day to protect you. Nothing is more important than getting you the protective equipment that you need so that you can continue to care for our communities. Thanks for all that you're doing, truly, from the bottom of my heart. I'm gonna end my formal remarks 
with what I said on Friday, there are many things that are not within our control right now, and that's really hard. But it, there are some things that we can do. We can act where we can. We can stay home. We can make sure that we're the healthiest we possibly can be. We can do this. We're strong, and we're in this together. With that, I'll turn it over to Director Sprayberry. Thank you, Madam Secretary, and good afternoon, everyone. Today is day 21 of the State Emergency Operations Center activation for the COVID-19 response. 55 counties now have their EOCs open and activated. 96 counties in the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians have declared local states of emergency. We're continuing to work aggressively every day to locate and acquire needed personal protective equipment for our healthcare workers and first responders to include masks, gloves, and gowns. <clears throat> Today, we're receiving our third shipment of personal protective equipment from the Strategic National Stockpile. We're expecting those supplies to arrive on several trucks today and tomorrow. In fact, before I came in here, I was notified that some of the trucks had already arrived. We've received two other shipments from the national stockpile over the past two weeks. We've also requested a half a million of each of the following items from the stockpile. N95 mask, procedure mask, gowns, gloves, face shields, and coveralls. In the first two shipments, we've received enough to cover these percentage of the requested items. 38% of the N95 mask, 91% of the procedure mask, 32% of the gloves, 14% of the gowns, 16% of the face shields. The national stockpile is not our only source of these supplies. We have a team working to source and purchase as much as we can on the private market. We've placed orders so far totaling about $92 million. Some of these supplies are now starting to arrive. We're also working to register and screen disaster medical volunteers, including retired doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals. More than 1,600 individuals have already registered to be medical volunteers and are currently being vetted prior to assignment. About 500 personnel have been approved so far. If you're a retired or formal medical professional who would like to volunteer, you can begin the process by registering online at terms.ncem.org. That's terms, T-E-R-M-S dot N-C-E-M, N-C-E-M dot org. North Carolina 211 continues to help hundreds of people every day with assistance and information related to the coronavirus. Over the weekend, top caller needs included motel payment assistment, assistance, closure of government offices, and COVID-19 control. By dialing 211, you can get help with food assistance and paying rent and utilities. More than 56,000 people are already receiving regular coronavirus text updates from 211. Just text COVID NC to 898-211. That's 898-211 to begin receiving regular updates. Thank you for your support of the state emergency response team. The team's working hard every day to help slow the spread of um, COVID-19. And with your cooperation, we can get through this together. Remember to call your loved ones each and every day. Let them know that you're doing well. And remember, we're in this together. One team, one mission, one family. Thank you. Sprayberry. I think now we will open up for questions. Hi, it's Claire Donnelly from WFAE Radio in Charlotte. I am wondering um, when you expect we'll start to see an impact from the stay-at-home order and how you all will determine whether it's working. I'll take that. I'll That's take that. This is Mandy Cohen. Thank you for the question. Um, so as you know, that one of the tools that we have to slow the spread of the virus is to increase 
as much social distancing as we can. We were lucky that the governor took very early and swift action on limiting large gatherings, closing our schools, and then closing bars and restaurants to, to in-person patrons, um, and now have moved to this today stay-at-home order. Again, we didn't have the luxury of time to know everything we'd want to know about this virus, but what we know of it is quite scary, and that we wanted to take these aggressive actions to slow the spread here in North Carolina. And as we continue to learn more and collect more data, we'll be looking at things like our increasing case counts, but also using new tools uh, that survey uh, the, the state in terms of who has COVID-19 and how are they recovering to understand are our tools that we've been using working? Are, is our social distancing actually slowing the spread of the virus and saving lives? So more to come on that as we, as we learn more over these coming weeks um, and use that information to help us tailor future interventions. Hi, my name is Kate Martin. I'm with Carolina Public Press. I want to know if these social distancing measures don't work as you would like, what are some of the other tools in the toolbox to increase social distan distancing and prevent the spread of the virus? Does that include closing airports and major transportation hubs or possibly the border? Thank you for that question. Our expectation with the governor's order to stay at home today, we are imploring North Carolinians to please heed our advice to stay home. I know that the North Carolinians are caring folk. We care for our communities and everyone needs to be doing their part to make sure that these measures do impact the spread of the virus. We've seen them work in other parts of the world and even other parts of this country. So we know with folks that pay attention to these, uh, to this advice, heed, heed these orders. Um, I think you're going to see us uh, have an impact in slowing the spread. We know that the virus is here in North Carolina. We can't change that fact. What we can do is slow the spread, and we will continue to do these social distancing measures to protect people here in North Carolina. Thank you. Hi there, this is Jason DeBruin with North Carolina Public Radio. Um, so my question is on testing and testing capacity. Um, I know there's been roughly, what, 21,000 that have been completed. How many more tests are there available in the pipeline and, and how many tests are going to be available or what will the capacity be uh, going forward, you know, over the next days, weeks, or even months? Thank you for that Thank question. For that Testing question. continues to be an area of focus. Um, we are wanting to make sure we are prioritizing testing particularly this week, next week, on those that are at high risk, those that are our healthcare workers who may have been exposed, those that are hospitalized, those that are in our long-term care facilities. Again, this helps us quickly understand if the, these folks are, are getting the virus in high-risk settings. We want to prevent further spread in the hospital or in long-term care settings. We want to make sure we're protecting our health care workers. So while we prioritize testing, we are still dealing at very high volume of testing. Testing is going to continue to be an important component of our work in fighting COVID-19. I think has, has been widely reported. Testing supplies have been and continue to be an issue as we work through this virus. Know that we're doing everything we can at the state level to both get the supplies we need and make sure that we're using our resources wisely to target them to those that are at highest risk. Um, and we're going to continue to work with our federal government, with academic partners and others to further ramp up our, our testing ability as we go forward. Secretary, this is Garrett Bergquist with Spectrum News. Uh, talk to a little bit about some of the exponential growth that we're seeing in cases over the past week. Uh, we've seen a pretty significant acceleration. Anything specific that's been driving that? Is it more characteristics of the virus itself? Is it more the result of other factors that were going on? What's driving that, and how does this differ from 
some of the more seasonal stuff we see. Um, thank you for the question. So we're learning a lot about this virus, looking at what's happened around the world and here in the United States in, in, in a few states that are a couple of weeks ahead of us. So looking at places like New York or um, the state of Washington to understand how is the virus moving there and what does that mean for us here in North Carolina? What we're learning is that this virus is pretty contagious. It's more contagious than the flu not quite as contagious as something like the measles. Luckily, we have vaccines for both of those diseases. The reason COVID-19 is so different is we don't have a vaccine. We don't have treatment um, and it is very contagious. So the tool that we have at our disposal is that social distancing until we have a vaccine. And so we have to be thoughtful about slowing the spread of the virus. But yes, we are seeing that growth in the number of cases we see in North Carolina because we know virus is here in our community. About a week ago, we, or maybe 10 days ago, we were able to trace all of our cases to contacts. We know someone had a contact with a, with a known case, but what we're seeing now is the virus is out in our community, which is why we've had to further ramp up our request of all of us to make sure that we're doing as much social distancing because that's really our major tool to keeping people safe. And I just go back to imploring everyone again, when the order goes in at five o'clock today to please, please heed that and stay at home. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Cohen. This is Andrea Blanford with ABC 11. Uh, this morning, we listened to Senator Tom Tillis on a town hall with constituents. He reiterated what's been said about the number of positive cases going up because of testing and that we'll hopefully see a decline in cases in the next four to six weeks. So I wanted to check with you, is that what you are seeing? Is this because of a ramp up in testing or are we seeing an actual increase in transmission? And with that, just how much of an impact do you think the change in weather coupled with the stay at home order will have um, on, on combating the virus? Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. So I think there are a number of factors why I think the, the the number of cases is going up the way it is in North Carolina. One, we are testing more, and that is right. So we are, we are doing uh, thousands and thousands of tests. Um, we've done over 20,000 tests, and of those, about 1,300 have now become positive. Um, so while we are testing more, we're going to find more. But what we are finding is a different kind of someone who is positive, as I mentioned um, in response to the last question where prior we were able to trace back each of those positive cases to someone who may have had contact with someone who was positive. What we're seeing now is that there is community spread of this virus, meaning that folks don't know where they picked it up from. Um, and that changes what we think about in terms of our level of response. It means we need to increase our social distancing. It means we need to make sure we're planning to have the medical capacity that is appropriate to respond to COVID-19. But what we, are, what we are seeing and what the CDC has said about North Carolina is that we are seeing widespread community transmission here in the state. Um, we are seeing the number of counties that are experiencing COVID-19 go up every day. I expect to see uh, COVID-19 in, in every county in North Carolina within the next couple of days, um, if not the week. Um, so we do expect to see more and more virus. I want to address the second part of your question about, well, when, when do we think that things are going to change? And that is a very hard question to answer. Um, there are a number of predictive models that, are, that are, have been circulating over the number of days. I know many in the news media have covered them. They all have slightly different assumptions and ways that they predict things. Um, and so we don't know with precision what this is going to look like. I think with every passing day, we learn a little bit more, uh, helps us know what we need to do in terms of tailoring our interventions. We know all of this social distancing is so hard on everyone um, and, and in so many different ways. So we want to be sure that we're making prudent decisions as we go forward and trying to tailor our interventions to what's happening here in North Carolina. The more we learn, the more we can, can tailor, and that is the work that is he ahead. But I cannot say with certainty um, in terms of timeframes and what that will, will mean for us going forward. 
I think you saw the, the president extend his order um, a, about social distancing through the end of April. I think that was very prudent um, to continue those activities through the month of April as we learn more and understand this virus better. Bob, Bob. Good afternoon, Dr. Cohen. This is Kimberly King with News 13 in Asheville. Can you give us any idea of when you feel North Carolina will be at the peak? You mentioned that we are two to three weeks, you think, behind New York. That would put us towards the mid to the end of April. Is that what you're thinking at this point? Thanks for the question about about the peak. Again, it is it is a hard thing to put your uh, our our precision around. I think New York doesn't know when their peak is with precision, though they are trying to predict that. We're going to learn more in the coming days and weeks to try to give us as much certainty as we can to understand this. Um, we're working with a number of data scientists, uh, scientists at Duke, at UNC, and RTI, to try to understand and make sense of the many different models that are out there and under tailor them to what's happening in North Carolina. So we hope to be able to share more information on that as we go. Um, but again, these are all predictions and this virus is some, something we are all learning about. We look at what's happening outside the United States and wanna tailor that to what is happening here in our country and the factors that matter to us. Obviously, North Carolina is not as densely populated as a New York. We don't have the international travel uh, like the New York airports. I think those are all protective things for North Carolina. But at the same time, we have many rural areas without as many hospital resources. Um, we have a population that is older and has more chronic medical conditions that puts people at higher risk. So we have to take all of those things on balance to understand what does the virus mean for us here in North Carolina so that we can tailor the solutions to our state um, and to uh, uh, those to make sure that we're protecting them in the best way possible. Hi, this is Chloe Leshner from WCNC Charlotte. Wondering again what the current backlog is and then what's the reason behind that? Are there just not enough workers in the state lab? Thanks. Thanks for the question. So there is not a backlog at the state lab. Rather, the backlog is at some of our private partners. Uh, LabCorp is one of the uh, North Carolina businesses that is doing a, a, an enormous amount of testing for COVID-19, but they're a national company. And so that means they have samples coming from all over the country um, and in addition to what's coming from North Carolina. Um, and so we know that they're working on throughput and capacity. Um, there, is, there is no backlog at, at the state lab, but again, we're trying to use our state lab to focus testing on our healthcare workers, on folks that are admitted to hospitals and long-term care settings, again, to make sure that we are protecting those settings and we're able to tailor uh, for, for isolation and outbreaks to prevent further spread in some of those settings. Um, but we are trying to work collaboratively with all of our partners, whether it's LabCorp or our, our academic university uh, labs. Uh, I think everyone is trying hard to ramp up their capacity. I want to remind folks that there is, there is a supply chain issue uh, all around um, on a number of things, pr protective equipment, on um, testing supplies, and we're going to have to work through that as a state and as a country uh, together as, as we do this, but we're trying to focus our resources and make sure we're prioritizing them in a way that helps us best respond to the virus. Hey, it's Randall Kerr at WRL-TV. Uh, I'm wondering, I mean, those of us that have been in this stay at home uh, for a couple of days, now it's going statewide. Um, if you go to a business that is essential and is allowed to stay open, and you notice they're not following social distancing rules, I mean, some stores will put crates in front of the cash register to keep your distance between you and the cashier, and some don't. I mean, if, what should you do if you're in that situation? 
Thanks for this. Look, we've, we're asking everyone to basically change their lives overnight. And so this is very hard. And so we appreciate that it's, it was going to take a few days for everyone to understand the stay at home order, which is why the governor announced it last Friday. It goes into effect Monday today at 5 p.m. Again, we are expecting folks to stay at home. That's what the governor tweeted. That's it. Stay at home unless you're going for your groceries, you're picking up medications, or you're taking a walk outside. Those folks who are working in essential businesses, we want them to do as much social distancing as possible given the nature of those essential jobs. I think you are going to see businesses continue that need to stay open to provide those essential services. I hope to continue to comply with social distancing as a consumer. If you are, uh, again, I hope you are only going out to those businesses for groceries, for medicines, or to, to your work if you're an essential worker. Um, if you see those settings that are unsafe from social distancing, speak up. We're all in this together. We're got to help each other out. And I think that means reminding each other about good hand washing, about the staying six feet apart. I'll say I've been very impressed um, in my own neighborhoods watching folks um, really try to embrace it. But it's hard. Um, and, and we get that. And not everyone's going to be perfect. But the more we can do um, right now, today, saves lives going forward. And the more we can do right now really does help us get a jump on where things are with this virus and reduce the spread now and prevents worse things from happening down the line. So thanks to you for ev everything that folks are doing right now um, and know that at 5 o'clock that, that order goes into place. Dr. Cohen, what about the 24-hour test that we've been hearing about? Where does that stand? Yes, there's been a lot of new discussion about new testing opportunities. There's one a rapid test that we've heard about that can be done in 45 minutes. These are all really good developments. It, the issue with some of those rapid tests is they can only run one or two at a time. The high throughput machines that we use can run hundreds at a time, but do take many more hours to run. So I think it's going to take all different kinds of ways to do testing to ramp up that capacity. Some quick rapid tests that might be used in local clinics, some bigger testing throughput machines that are used at our labs and our hospitals. I think it's going to take all of those to, for us to be able to do um, the testing we need, and we'll continue to work on ramping that up. I think that's going to be a concerted effort that is need be needed between the federal government and what the work here in the state. Obviously, the federal government is in charge of approving these various tests. We need to make sure these tests work, right? We want to make sure that we're identifying COVID-19 appropriately. The worst thing to do is to put out a test that doesn't work because then we don't know what those results mean. So we need the FDA to do its work to make sure we're getting a test that works. But we also need to act quickly and ramp up our capacity. Um, and I, so I know a lot of work going on around that uh, federally and here at the state. Hey, it's Gary Robertson with Associated Press. Uh, we heard that over the weekend uh, we have about a couple dozen positive cases at a rest home in Northampton County. Is there any particular concern about that cluster, and is anything being done specifically by the local health department or by the state to address that? Yeah, yeah thanks for that question. And, and as we've been saying for many weeks, one of my – primary areas of concern are those that live in congregate settings, our nursing homes, our adult care homes, and other settings um, where folks are are frail from a, from a medical perspective to begin with, but are also in close quarters with each other. Um, so when we hear of an outbreak, uh, it is our local health departments that work very closely um, with folks to help them isolate folks with uh, COVID-19 from other people who may not have been exposed yet to the virus but we know this virus is is contagious and it spreads and so this is very challenging so what we are focused on this week is going even further to say how do we protect those um, vulnerable settings, those long-term care facilities, our nursing homes and others. Is there even more we can do? Um, so I know our teams are working on some additional guidance because I think prevention is going to be the best medicine here for us and we'll keep focused on that. 
because I will say those populations continue to be um, one of my biggest areas of, of concern as we go, go forward here. But thanks to our local health departments for working with these many settings across our state to make sure they're as safe as possible. And with that, I know we're wrapping up here. Just want to thank everyone again for their attention. Thank you, Director Sprayberry. I know as we get more into the medical surge capacity work, there's going to be more questions coming your way. Um, but thank you uh, to all of you. And again, one last shout out to my fellow doctors out there on Doctor's Day, your heroes. I thank you, and we're working hard for you every day. Thanks.